Uh, welcome all. Thank you all for joining uh, this uh, seminar hosted by LEARN. But I also see uh, many guests, um, uh, my colleagues here at uh, Biological Psychology, some of which are also then a part of LEARN. So today we have the honor of having Margarita Melancini as our speaker just before she goes on maternity leave next week. So we're, we were just on time of grabbing her and flying her over virtually from London to Amsterdam. So uh, Margarita um, moved, I think, 15 years ago from it Italy to, uh, to the UK. And she has been at several uh, London-based universities for her, her studies. And then after her PhD, which, uh, in which she used stats data, uh, she moved to Austin, uh, Texas uh, to work as a postdoc there and then moved back to take up a lectureship at Queen's Mary University in London. And she is a um, developmental psychologist and studies individual differences related to learning, education and cognition. Margarita, the floor is yours. And oh. I saw your tweet just now with the preprints. Yes, exactly. So thank you so much for uh, such a lovely introduction and uh, yes so um, the the paper I'll be presenting today actually came out as a preprint last night so fresh uh, fresh uh, um, knowledge uh, and uh, so what I'll be talking about today is a meta-analysis that um, we conducted uh, on the genetic and environmental influences of neurodevelopmental disorders and common co-occurring conditions during childhood and adolescence. And this is very much work that has been uh, uh, really led and spearheaded by my wonderful PhD student who is also online, uh, Aga Gizella. And um, so really she did all of the heavy lifting uh, on this. So, uh, and she's uh, also here online that she will, she, she will join the Q&A later on if you uh, guys have any more detailed question. I was saying to Elsa before that I, I might not be able, you know, to uh, remember all of the technicalities, but Aga does uh, for sure. Um, so uh, she did fantastic work on this, a huge effort. You will see the extent of this meta-analysis is, is huge. So um, massive congratulations to her on this preprint that came out last night as well. So why did we decide to look at neurodevelopmental disorders and their etiology? Well, first of all, neurodevelopmental disorders are a serious and growing health concern. As you can see, uh, data here from our world in data on uh, unfortunately, most of the data that is available is on uh, ADHD and ASD, um, much less data on uh, intellectual disability, for example. But as you can see, from the 90s to uh, a couple of years ago, uh, all neurodevelopmental diagnoses of neurodevelopmental disorders have been increasing, particularly uh, those of uh, ASD, but, but generally is an increasing uh, and serious health concern. And uh, as you can see from this graph, also the, uh, the prevalence of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, some neurodevelopmental disorders, I should say, is not equal uh, in males and females. And this is something that we will also explore um, in the work I'll present now. Um, but also, but for other neurodevelopmental disorders, the, um, the prevalence is, uh, is actually quite uh, comparable across sexes, for example, for intellectual disability. Uh, as shown over here. And uh, one important thing to highlight is that, um, you know, ne neurodevelopmental disorders are uh, uh, investigated and um, prevalent um, all over the world, but the prevalence really differs uh, for different continents and different states. And there are several geographical differences uh, in the prevalence between different neuro neurodevelopmental disorders. But uh, particularly, this really highlights not necessarily the difference in prevalence, but really the difference uh, in uh, access, the, the differential uh, abilities that there is in accessing diagnosis between countries. And this is uh, these differences between countries is something that we will explore in greater detail in our work as well. So, but. But overall, we decided to focus on NDDs, uh, first of all, because they are a growing, growing health concern, and second of all, because uh, they are um, a growing health concern that is reported all over the world, although there is 
a lot of um, um, and there are a lot of differences in the ability to diagnose them and to access treatment. Now, why did we decide to, to focus on the genetic and environmental, on the etiology of neurodevelopmental disorders? And uh, do genetic factors even matter? And genetic factors do matter for, uh, do, do contribute to individual differences in neurodevelopmental disorders, to diagnosis in neurodevelopmental disorders, and to their co-occurrence. So, uh, as you can see in the in the picture here um, on the uh, on the on the left, um, you can you can see that um, that there is uh, familiarity in the lifetime uh, risk for uh, ADHD and ASD, and here you can see the extent of uh, to which ADHD and ASD are heritable. So these are two of the most heritable. Uh, conditions uh, that we know of uh, with heritabilities of about 80% uh, for ADHD and 90% uh, for uh, autism spectrum disorder, particularly when, um, so, well, when looking at uh, heritability estimates uh, using uh, twin designs and much lower has estimates of heritability using different uh, DNA-based methods, but still substantial evidence for the genetic contribution uh, to neurodevelopmental disorders. And we also know uh, that uh, there, are, uh, there is a genetic overlap between uh, different neurodevelopmental disorders, particularly shown for uh, ADHD and ASD. So although we know that neurodevelopmental disorders and particularly autism spectrum disorders and attention deficit hyperactivity disorders are partly uh, due to genetic differences between people, um, we really lack a systematic understanding of, of the extent to which genetic and environmental factors contribute to all neurodevelopmental disorders. And in fact, most studies, meta-analysis, literature reviews, synthesis of the literature have focused disproportionately really on uh, autism spectrum disorders, uh, disorder and ADHD. And all other neurodevelopmental disorders have been mostly uh, overlooked, although uh, some of them show simil similar pre prevalence rates, some even higher prevalence rates than ADHD um, and autism. And in fact, the DSM-5 uh, includes seven separate uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So these are intellectual disabilities, communication disorder, uh, autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, specific learning disorders, such as, for example, dyslexia and dyscalculia, motor disorder, and then other neurodevelopmental disorders. And, um, and what uh, we really wanted to um, explore with this um, meta-analysis are three core questions. The first um, aim was to meta-analyze all of the studies on the contribution of genetic and environmental factors to all, neuro all these neurodevelopmental disorder categories that are, uh, that are identified by the DSM-5. And the second aim, um, our second aim was to look at the extent to which genetic influences on these neurodevelopmental disorders overlapped. So to what extent are the same genes that contribute to one neurodevelopmental disorders also implicated in other neurodevelopmental disorders? And so we meta-analyzed the estimates of the genetic and environmental co-occurrence between different neurodevelopmental disorders, all of these different uh, categories, the seven categories um, that, uh, I previously talked about. And lastly, we really wanted to look at how neurodevelopmental disorders and, and, and particularly their etiology was overlapping with other disorders that um, develop onset and develop during childhood and adolescence as do neurodevelopmental disorders. And we uh, particularly decided to focus because of that on the most common other category 
of disorders that onset and develop during childhood and adolescence. So disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. And these are the disorders, uh, several disorders that are identified in the DSM-5, um, particularly uh, ODD, so oppositional defiant disorder, intermittent and explosive disorder, conduct disorder, antisocial personality disorder, uh, pyromanic kleptomania, and other specified, specified and unspecified uh, uh, DICCs, we call them. So these are the three core aim of the work I will be presenting today. So first understand to what, uh, to first really have a clear view of the extent to which genetic and environmental factors matter for all of these different neurodevelopmental disorders, not just focusing on ADHD and ASD. The second, to look at the extent to which genetic and environmental factors contribute to the overlap between all, all of these different neurodevelopmental disorders. And lastly, the extent to which genetic and environmental factors contribute to the overlap that is observed between neurodevelopment and uh, the ICCs. So we, of course, set out to, um, uh, we, we had to um, set boundaries in terms of what we were looking for in the published literature. And so we first of all decided on the methodologies that we, we were going to include in this meta-analysis uh, to really estimate the extent to which genetic and environmental factors contribute uh, to NDDs and their co-occurrences. And so we uh, decided that we wanted to uh, include studies that estimated genetic and environmental contributions to uh, neurodevelopmental disorders um, using both family-based designs, and these are twin and sibling comparison designs. And very briefly, uh, twin studies um, uh, allow to estimate the extent to which genetic and environmental factors contribute to uh, individual differences in a given trait by comparing the similarities between monozygotic twins who share 100% of the uh, genetic makeup and dizygotic twins who share um, on average 50% of the segregating genes that are the genes that differ between people. And uh, twin studies allow to, and by um, comparing uh, this co concordance between these two sets of twins, it's possible to derive estimates of genetic influence or heritability, uh, no, uh, shared environmental influences, which are these uh, environmental factors that contribute to similarities between uh, twins raised in the same family or, or, or um, siblings raised in the same family, and non-shared environmental influences, which are those environmental factors that don't contribute to similarity between siblings, twins raised in the same family. And, but also we decided to include uh, DNA-based uh, designs, uh, and particularly um, uh, GRAMO, uh, genome-based recycling maximum likelihood, uh, linkages is this equilibrium score regression and the Bayesian analysis of GWAS summary data, although we didn't find any studies that I'd actually used that in childhood and adolescent samples. So, um, and of course, then we had to set some key inclusion criteria. So what kind of studies did we, did we want to focus on? And we wanted to focus uh, on uh, childhood and adolescents because uh, we thought that that was, um, uh, the most important um, time to focus on, particularly when looking at neurodevelopmental disorders and the co-occurrence with uh, uh, disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. Having said that, uh, it is now well known that um, a lot of NDDs actually progress and continue uh, throughout childhood, adolescence and adulthood, but not all of them. While some tend to, um, uh, to be to manifest and really be um, experienced over the life course, some others don't. And so we wanted really to focus on, um, on children and adolescents to, to really capture uh, quite well this, um, this, this time of onset and uh, development across all neurodevelopmental disorders, but also the time that is most relevant for the disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. So we decided to include studies that used populations uh, aged between uh, four and 24 in line with the uh, World, World Health Organization guidelines uh, for the definition of childhood and adolescence. And then uh, another inclusion criteria was the fact that data 
had to be available on at, on at least one neurodevelopmental disorders for our first aim, at least two neurodevelopmental disorders to look at the co-occurrence, and then at least one neurodevelopmental disorder and one uh, disruptive impulse control and conduct disorder to look at our third aim. And uh, of course, studied ha studies had to include either estimates of heritability or environmental influences or genetic or environmental correlations between uh, disorders. And uh, we included both uh, um, measures uh, of uh, like, so quantitative measures of neurodevelopmental disorders and disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders, but also um, um, binary measures of clin either clinical cutoffs or formal diagnosis of NDDs or the ICCs. And studies had to be published in English. Of course, well, if you look at the preprint, we have a much longer set of <laughs> inclusion and exclusion criteria. So if you are interested in all of the methodologies, then uh, I strongly recommend uh, looking at our uh, uh, preprint. And also we had some core exclusion criteria. So first of all, we excluded particip studies that had included participants that were selected based on having an extreme environmental insult, for example, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome or um, any other major um, environmental uh, insult. Uh, and then uh, we excluded studies that had estimated heritability and environmental influences across multiple generation uh, for family designs, for example, uh, the children of, tw of twins or the in vitro fertilization uh, designs. And this um, was because uh, the estimates of heritability and environmental influences were not necess necessarily comparable across one between one generation and multiple generation family based designs uh, due to the potential confounding of including parental traits in the model. So we really focused on one generation uh, studies. And uh, and so we set out to and, and started all of the searches and the screening. And this is uh, something that uh, Aga really uh, led. And uh, she must have read thousands of papers. And so we started off from uh, um, twelve over 12,000 uh, studies that were imported for screening. And after removing duplicate over 8,000, and uh, after all of the process of screening and um, uh, so full, so abstract and uh, title screening and then full text screening, and uh, we ended up with 296 studies that were included, uh, were eligible to be included in the meta-analysis. And so they were included uh, um, in our data extraction. And this really includes a sample of over 4, 4 million uh, children and adolescents, so quite an extensive uh, uh, sample. Uh, uh, of course, these are partly overlapping and they're not completely independent, but uh, um, so, um, but quite a large sample. And, uh, and we um, did all of this uh, with, um, with the help of Covidence, which is a software that really allows to, um, to do screening and double blinding reviews um, of papers uh, for meta-analysis. And, and, and our meta-analysis was registered um, uh, with Prospero and we adhered to the PRISMA uh, guideline for transparent reporting of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So if you're interested, you can go and look at our plan uh, there as well. Um, uh, we found it was very, very helpful to um, to include, um, to, to really uh, write these plans and write these pre-registrations to, uh, to then uh, conduct this meta-analysis in the most transparent way uh, possible. So I uh, highly recommend uh, doing that if you are interested in, uh, in, uh, in conducting a meta-analysis. So this, I'm now realizing that I'm only sharing a portion of my screen, so you can't see the <laughs> my lovely animation of what a meta-analysis does, but I can tell you. So there are no animations on my slides, I'm very sorry, but this was an animation of how basically, what's the purpose of a meta-analysis? You have several studies of different, uh, uh, with different sample sizes, and the meta-analysis uh, really allows you to, um, to obtain a grand estimate that, take, that takes into account the different power that all of the different studies have. And so uh, the studies that are uh, larger and with a greater sample will, uh, will go and, and be weighted more than uh, smaller studies that are 
potentially less reliable. And so we conducted this meta-analysis um, uh, in um, uh, metaphor for R, uh, this is an R package, and we applied multi-level random effect meta-analysis um, with really a two-level structure. At the level one, we included uh, individual clustering, and then at level two, um, we clustered by um, cohort. So, uh, in order to account for the fact that particularly in genetic research, cohorts are partly overlapping. So, uh, and studies are, are partly overlapping within cohorts. So for example, a lot of studies have used NTR, a lot of studies have used uh, the twins early development studies. A lot of, so to account for this part non-independence of, of observation, we included a multi-level structure in our meta-analysis. And we meta-analyzed three core effect sizes, heritability or environmental influences, genetic and environmental correlations, uh, so, so two, and then we used standard error um, um, as a measure of um, uh, precision around uh, these estimates. And however, multi-level meta-analytic meta methods really allow to account for uh, non-independence non of estimates on the same cohort of participants, but they don't allow to account for the non-independence of estimates at the level of each study. So uh, studies sometimes report more than one uh, estimate on, um, on different um, um, partly related research questions. And so in order to account for that extra dependence, we aggregated dependent effect sizes at the level of each study using the um, R package uh, MAD, so meta-analysis for mean differences. And we um, set a default correlation for disaggregation estimates between, um, uh, between uh, effects that were dependent because uh, they were obtained from the same study of 0.5. However, we conducted several sensitivity analyses to explore whether at different levels of the correlation between these dependent estimates, we were seeing different uh, results and we didn't. And so uh, as you can see in the, in the figure on the, on the right over here, and so we decided to proceed um, with reporting uh, the, the estimates aggregated at 0.5 in our paper. And we didn't have to include um, di different uh, estimates. So estimates uh, aggregated at different thresholds just because these were really comparable across uh, different uh, thresholds of the correlation between effect sizes. Um, and so now, after I've gone into the methodology, what did we find? So first of all, we were interested in looking at the contribution of genetic and environmental factors to all neurodevelopmental disorders. And what we found was that all neurodevelopmental disorders, not just autism and ADHD, are substantially heritable. And we obtain a grand heritability estimate of 0.66. And um, uh, however, this differed um, not significantly, but differed quite a bit between neurodevelopmental disorders with uh, uh, some um, showing greater levels of heritability than others, but overall estimate did not differ significantly between all neurodevelopmental disorders. All were substantially heritable. We found uh, that shared environmental factors, so uh, those factors that contribute to similarities between children raised in the same families, for example, shared parenting or um, shared experiences, uh, had a uh, modest contribution to all neurodevelopmental disorders uh, with an uh, estimate of uh, 0 0.17, so 17% of the variation in neurodevelopmental disorders could be explained by shared environmental factors, and non-shared environmental factors had a moderate contribution, so about 30%, 29% of individual differences of differences between children and adolescents in neurodevelopmental disorders could be accounted for um, by uh, non-shared environmental factors. However, as you can see in the picture, uh, and now I'm regretting sharing part of my screen, I should have just gone full screen, but as you can see uh, in the, the picture at the bottom uh, right, uh, the effect sizes across 
all studies varied quite a lot. There was a lot of heterogeneity in the effect studies that we found for uh, family-based uh, uh, heritability, uh, shared environment and non-shared environment as is indicated by these density plots um, over here. And even in the um, um, estimates obtained. Uh, um, so, and I should also say that uh, estimates uh, obtained from DNA, so looking at uh, SNP heritability, um, were, of course, as expected, much lower than the heritability estimates obtained from family-based designs. Uh, and uh, the grand estimate was uh, 0.9, so 19% of the variance uh, across all neurodevelopmental disorders. But this is to be expected as um, uh, SNP heritability tends to be much lower than family-based heritability for a whole set uh, of reasons that we will be discussing later on. But so this was at the very at the level of each neurodevelopmental disorder category observed uh, in the DSM. We also looked more specifically at uh, subcategories within each disorder. So, uh, for example, if you look at the um, at the dark green uh, bars over here, this is all the subcategories uh, of specific uh, learning disorders and uh, dyslexia-related phenotypes. So, you have dyslexia and uh, uh, word reading, vocabulary, spelling, reading fluency, reading comprehension. So. We also went in, into much um, finer, uh, we took a much finer grained approach and look at how uh, heritability, shared environmental and shared environmental estimates differed at the level of all of these specific uh, learning um, what, and neurodevelopmental disorders. And for example, if you take the, the, um, the, the blue, the light blue bars over here are all the ADHD related phenotypes. And here you can see that uh, heritability estimates are really quite comparable across all of the ADHD phenotypes. Um, but they are not, for example, across all of the um, reading and dyslexia related phenotypes. For example, vocabulary uh, showed a much uh, lower grand heritability estimate um, than. Uh, other aspects uh, of neurodevelopmental disorders or uh, other aspects of dyslexia, for example, calculations and problem solving uh, were showed uh, less, less grand heritability estimates than uh, other um, uh, aspects of neurodevelopmental disorders, for example, um, uh, ADHD, uh, hyperactivity, uh, all the autism related um, phenotypes. And we could also do it only partly for SNP heritability depend because that was really based on the on only the data that was available. Um, uh, but we, uh, we found that the, the SNP heritability estimates were uh, varied, but not, not significantly across all of these um, um, more sp uh, specialized categories as well. So um, if you're interested in, uh, in all of the more specific uh, components of every neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, do a, go and check out the uh, supplementary material of the preprint that I showed you at the beginning, because you can find a lot of very interesting uh, findings that really go into um, much greater, much finer grained uh, details. But overall, the, I guess the take home message is that all neurodevelopmental disorders and all uh, their uh, subcategories are substantially heritable. Um, so that genetic factors do contribute to individual differences across the entire neurodevelopmental disorder spectrums and also uh, across all of these different categories. Um, most of them, in fact, are not significantly different from each other. So now going to the second, uh, our second aim, we were interested in uh, the extent to which genetic and environmental factors uh, underlie the co-occurrence between all of these different neurodevelopmental disorders. And this is really shown um, in this half, well, these three quarters of a circular plot uh, here. So 
here you have on the um, external um, circle, you have all of the neurodevelopmental disorders for which we could find uh, data. Uh, so ADHD, um, communication disorder, autism spectrum disorder, uh, motor disorder, uh, and specific learning disorder. And uh, the connectors between each part of the circle are the extent to which are uh, um, the, the size of the connectors are the extent to which disorders are correlated genetically. So the thicker the line, the stronger the genetic correlation between disorders. So overall, we found that the genetic correlation between neurodevelopmental disorders was moderate. So with a was a correlation of 0.36 across 37 studies, but we did find an incredible uh, degree of heterogeneity between these estimates. So with correlations as strong as 0.9 uh, between uh, ADHD and motor disorder, although the, that estimate, you know, the precision around that estimate was very low due to the uh, small sample size and the small number of studies. And uh, also, um, a strong, very strong genetic correlations between um, uh, our usual suspect, autism spectrum disorder and uh, ADHD, but much weaker genetic correlations between other neurodevelopmental disorders, for example, ADHD and specific learning disorders with a correlation of 0 0.07, so very little overlap between these disorders. And one thing that we started noticing is that was the emergence of a major gap in the literature that we expected, but to a much lower extent. So these overlaps could not really be calculated for all NDD pairs. For example, uh, we couldn't calculate this overlap for intellectual disability, or we could calculate only very small overlaps between, uh, so only an overlap between, for example, specific learning disorders and ADHD and communication disorders, but not between all disorder pairs. So really the literature is not complete in, our knowledge of the etiology of the overlap between neurodevelopmental disorders. Margarita, sorry to interrupt. Oh, yes. I'm just seeing your graph and it looks like beautiful art, but can you maybe walk us through how we should read this piece of, course. of art? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, of course. So if Thanks. you if you look at the external um, um, the external portion of this circle, so it's divided by different disorders. So for example, in red here, you see ADHD, and, and you, you see lots of rivers going into ADHD, right? And so within, um, uh, so each river indicates the correlation between ADHD, let's say, and let's take this uh, black little one and specific learning disorder over here. And the thicker the line, the larger the size of the correlation between these two portions of the circle. And as you can see, this line between uh, specific learning disorders and ADHD is very thin, uh, which indicates a very, very small correlation, genetic correlation in this case, uh, because it's a, it's a plot just for genetic correlations between specific learning disorders and ADHD. The correlation between specific learning disorder and communication disorder, for example, is much thicker which indicates a much, a, a much larger genetic overlap between specific learning disorder and communication disorder that we found. And same, for example, for motor disorder and ADHD, as we saw that was the strongest genetic overlap with a correlation of, uh, genetic correlation of 0.9, um, and a, a much weaker overlap between motor disorder and communication disorder, for example, here. So yes, uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for uh, uh, for reminding me. Um, but now you will be able then to follow this one <laughs> really well, which is the which shows the um, the environmental overlap between uh, different neurodevelopmental disorders, and we found even less data that looked add environmental overlap because some studies only reported uh, heritability, for example, and, uh, and also because when uh, studies uh, presented different models, we included the best fitting model and the best fitting model often did not include shared environmental factors. So, but anyway, we can see that a grand shared environmental co-occurrence of 0.63, although the standard error is quite large, but this could only be uh, calculated for 43% of the total number of studies, 
So out of the 37, only 43% had data on uh, shared environmental co-occurrences between NDDs and um, a grand non shared environmental co-occurrence of uh, 0.17, so quite small, as we expected. But this could only be meta-analyzed for uh, ADHD, ASD, and uh, specific learning disorders. So quite a lot of gap in our data and could only met be meta-analyzed independently. In, uh, in the general, in the transdiagnostic meta-analysis, we also had uh, individual studies that looked at individual disorders, but these are, um, but we needed at, at least more than one study to provide a meta-analytic estimate that was independent for disorder pairs and uh, specific disorder pairs, and we could only find more than one estimate in for uh, disorder pairs for ADHD, ASD, and SLD. So already highlighting a major, major gap in our knowledge of the etiology of neurodevelopmental disorders. And this really, uh, progresses as we move into, into um, examining the co-occurrence between neurodevelopmental disorders and disruptive and impulse control and conduct disorders. So overall, we found that the, over, the genetic overlap between NDDs and DICCs was strong, uh, and they, they did share as much as the uh, genetics uh, with NDDs as NDDs did between uh, one another, particularly entities that are quite uh, strongly uh, connected, for example, ASD and ADHD or ADHD and motor disorder. Um, however, we found that the estimates varied between disorders, but really this could only be calculated for very few disorder pairs. So we could only look at the association between these two uh, disruptive and impulse control and conduct disorders, so ODD, uh, oppositional defined disorder and conduct disorders and how they overlapped with ADHD and, ADS and, and ASD for conduct disorder. So again, uh, the, our knowledge is really mostly limited to the overlap between ADHD and ASD and other disorders. And again, between ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. So uh, there is the major, major gap in, a, in the literature because this, as the, the overlap between other disruptive and impulse control disorders and other entities really could not be uh, calculated. Um, and, and, and we really have uh, very little knowledge of the etiology of the overlap between all these disorders. And as we did before, we went into uh, more fine-grained details about um, the overlap between NDDs uh, and, and, and between NDDs and the ICCs. And we did, and as you can see from this plot here, for example, even at the genetic level uh, in, uh, in, in these uh, bars in the top uh, left, you can see that there is a great, great deal of heterogeneity uh, in the um, overlap between different neurodevelopmental disorders and um, different, neuro, uh, different aspects of neurodevelopmental disorders and disruptive in, and impulse control and conduct disorders. So um, really this highlights a major, major, major research gap. So uh, if you take this whole chart of neurodevelopmental disorders and disruptive and impulse control and conduct disorders, the genetic and environmental etiology of their associations could only be uh, estimated, meta-analyzed for ASD and ADHD, our usual suspects, and ODD and conduct disorder. And, uh, and this really highlights how we are missing out on investigating so much more. Um, so we really are missing uh, out of knowledge uh, big time <laughs> at, the, at the level of all new development. So that we really must uh, achieve a much more holistic understanding of the sources of etiology and sources of co-occurrence between neurodevelopmental disorders and disruptive and impulse control and conduct disorders. We then went further and explored the level of uh, the, the effect of several several uh, moderators, and I'm going to uh, focus on a few 
uh, now uh, in the interest of time. So we found, first of all, that there were no sex differences in the family-based heritability and environmental estimates, although, so, although neurodevelopmental disorders, as I showed you at the beginning, really don't occur in uh, the prevalence is not the same between males and females. At the level of their etiology, we didn't find any significant dif sex differences in the heritability um, uh, and uh, environmental estimates uh, between males and females. Uh, so heritabilities were high for both males and females. We did find sex differences in uh, uh, SNP heritabilities, although the standard errors were quite large. Um, and we did find some sex differences in the genetic co-occurrence between NDDs, uh, quite a lot, quite a substantial difference. But the, the, the issue there was that uh, we found there were very few studies that reported estimates separately for males and females. So again, quite a, a big research uh, gap there. And uh, another interesting moderator that we looked at was age, and we found that genetic and environmental influences on NDD really are stable uh, developmentally, something that we didn't necessarily expect. Uh, with uh, heritability uh, estimates um, going from 0.65 uh, in childhood to 0.68 uh, in uh, middle childhood and 0.62 in uh, adolescence when considering all NDDs combined. So, um, so quite a lot of stability and quite a lot of stability in environmental influences as well. Uh, although the trends differed between different disorders, but overall, uh, all estimates, as you can see in these plots, were uh, fairly stable. So we didn't find uh, an increase in heritability with age, for example, as is observed for some other psychiatric disorders or for uh, cognitive ability, for example. Um, and then we really uh, we looked at whether the heritability uh, of neurodevelopmental disorders and uh, the, the, the etiology of their co-occurrences differed at different level, at, at, at different, um, with geography at the, in different countries. And we did find significant differences uh, at the level of each country. Uh, for example, if you take the plot here uh, on the left, we found uh, this looks at the differences, geographical differences in family-based heritability. And we found that the highest heritability was obtained in Australian and Swedish samples and lowest heritability in Can Canadian sample. These were uh, significantly different between one another. And when looking at the genetic correlations, so again, we found uh, strong genetic correlations in Swedish samples and the lowest genetic overlap in uh, Canadian samples. And uh, when looking at the overlap between NDDs and the ICCs, uh, this could only be estimated uh, in three countries. Um, and we found that this did not differ significantly between the UK, USA, and uh, Sweden. Uh, and last, lastly, the, only, the, the, the other uh, last moderator will be talking about today, but we did explore more. Uh, we really, we looked at how uh, the heritability of NDD, NDDs differed at different level of um, ancestral composition of our sample. So um, we looked uh, and we found that, uh, unfortunately, uh, and this highlights again another major gap in our uh, knowledge uh, and in genetic research more generally that we are very aware of, we could only calculate ancestral diversity, ancestral diversity as percentage of, what, of a sample of white European ancestry. And so we found that um, the heritability increase with an increases, increasing percentage of participants of European ancestry. So from 0.46, when uh, uh, participants of European ancestry were less than half of the sample to 0.66, when uh, participants of European ancestry made up 100% of the sample. And really, this highlights how genetic effects uh, cannot be separated from uh, the social context, how genetic and environmental effects are always environmentally contingent, particularly when we're looking at traits uh, such as uh, neurodevelopmental disorders and disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. And we also looked at uh, whether the estimates differed between different measures, and, and we found that um, 
although for um, uh, heritability uh, estimates were uh, higher um, uh, for categorical, uh, when NDDs were measured categorically, if compared to continuous overall, these estimates remained uh, substantial. And the opposite pattern of um, effects was observed when considering SNP heritability, so genetic uh, DNA-based genetic effects. So we also looked at other moderators. And uh, again, I encourage you to look at the preprint if you are interested uh, in uh, looking at what we did. And so overall, we think that our work um, highlights really the need of moving beyond the nearly exclusive, exclusive research focus that there is on ASD and ADHD and really highlights how much uh, of a focus this has been. And we didn't expect uh, to find such an unbalanced uh, literature uh, when we uh, started this meta-analysis. And this has really corroborated a major uh, issue uh, in our knowledge and understanding of neurodevelopmental disorders. We uh, found that genetic factors are implicated in the co-occurrence between uh, multiple NDDs, and we identified patterns of shared etiological liability between NDDs. So some are much more genetically uh, overlapping than others. Um, and also uh, we found that NDDs share as much, uh, most NDDs share as much as the, of their genetic variants as do NDDs with uh, other developmental disorders that are not included in the neurodevelopmental disorder categories in the DSM, so the ICCs. And, uh, and again, when we look at other moderators, we found that although males are four times more likely to be diagnosed with neurodevelopmental disorders than females, the genetic effects on NDDs don't differ between sex, they are stable over development, and uh, they're mostly consistent also when we separate between clinical cutoffs and continuous measures. They, uh, the genetic contributions to NDD differ substantially as a function of geography and also as a function of ancestry. And, um, and we really identified major gaps in our, our knowledge of the etiology of NDDs in non-Western countries, and a gap that is only exceeded by the lack of ancestral diversity observed across all studies of NDDs. Um, we found that genetic influences of NDD were substantially reduced in more ancestrally diverse samples, and this increased ancestral homogeneity within the sample likely entails an increased environmental homogeneity. And this is likely the reason why we find uh, reduced environmental effects and an inflation the heritability estimate due to this greater environmental homogeneity. Uh, within ancestry. And um, of course, lack of diversity remains one of the most striking limitations of genetics research to date. Um, and it's likely to have a profound cascading effect for future advances in clinical practice, including pharmacological and behavioral treatment. And fortunately, there are some major initiatives underway to rebalance these biases. So uh, hopefully, but we are quite a long way away. Uh, when looking at the association between neurodevelopmental disorders, we found quite a lot of heterogeneity, uh, strong genetic correlations between uh, ASD and ADHD and ASD, ADHD and motor disorders, but much weaker correlations between other disorders. Um, and also we identified major research uh, gap uh, that highlight really an imbalance in focus across NDDs uh, in developmental behavioral genetics research, which we hope future uh, studies and research uh, and, and, and funding opportunities will be able to address. Um, and this lack of equity in focus was really very evident when looking at the third aim of our research, so the overlap between NDDs and the ICCs. Uh, that could only be estimated for ADHD and ASD and uh, ODD and uh, conduct disorder. So uh, a, a major research gap. So overall, we hope that this work uh, has started to provide us with a, with a holistic view of the genetic and environmental contributions to all neurodevelopmental disorders and their commonly occurring uh, developmental uh, conditions. And we highlight 
a lack of balance in the research efforts that have been invested across different disorders. And really this calls for future genetic research to focus on less investigated neurodevelopmental disorders. And we hope that the knowledge that we have provided in this work about the etiological co-occurrence between NDDs and between NDDs and the ICCs could really um, start informing uh, clinical and educational diagnostics uh, and practice. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, to thank Aga for all the fantastic work uh, that she did in this preprint that if you're interested, uh, I recommend reading. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks a lot, Margarita. So the floor is open to questions. So maybe people uh, would like to uh, put on their cameras so we can see each other. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen, maybe. So if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. Perlene. Pauline Lemos, that oh, there you are. Oh, hi, Pauline. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for the talk. That was very interesting. I was wondering, like, do you know what could explain this gap in the research? Like, what? Why is it that the research only focuses on ADHD and uh, ASD? I think, uh, well, uh, two two core things in our opinion: uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, mostly uh, interested in uh, ADHD. Uh, and also uh, very strong parental lobbies uh, for ASD that have lobbied a lot for uh, research into ASD and, and there aren't as strong uh, uh, parental lobbies uh, when looking at other neurodevelopmental disorders. So, uh, so we think that these are the two key um, major uh, reasons why uh, there is this gap, but is, we did not expect such a huge gap, the huge gap that we found when we saw, when we set off to, to conduct this meta-analysis, particularly in the overlap between NDDs and the ICCs, there is very little and, um, and we didn't expect it. So I, I, we think that those are the two key reasons, but I don't know whether anybody has any other suggestions. Like, uh, I'd, I'd be really interested in knowing what you guys think. Berlin, if, you, if you're interested, you can also look up the paper by Dorothy Bishop from uh, 20, 20, 2010, Impulse One in which he um, studied like how much funding and how much papers are on different developmental disorders. And then you can clearly see that developmental language disorder, developmental motor coordination disorder and um, dyscalculia are the fewest research in the research. Yes, exactly. We, we cite that paper a couple of times at least. Yeah, the world. yeah it's great. <laughs> So, yeah. so, that, so that's not linked to prevalence of the disorder in a way. It's no, really... not at all. Okay. You, you yeah. think that in, in, in intellectual disabilities uh, very, is twice as prevalent, three times as prevalent as uh, autism. But there is, okay. there are, we found two genetically informative studies on intellectual disability. Well, one actually, the largest one came out uh, a couple of months ago, so now three, <laughs> but then they're mostly in Swedish sample as well. So, uh, so very, very little. Uh, and this is a, a prevalence of double, uh, well, three times that of ASD. So, unfortunately, okay, thanks. Prevalence often, often to money. <laughs> yeah, indeed, money. So when so ASD and ADHD are researched both in the medical field, where there's way more money and in the educational field. And some of the other disorders are only studied in the educational field. Exactly, so there is this major gap, exactly. There is this major gap uh, between the, the NDDs and the ICCs. And, and one seems to be the realm of psychiatrists and the other one of educationalists. And there is very little uh, research in their overlap. Although we, we we show that the, their overlap is as strong, actually, uh, well, for what we for the, the, the data that we found as strong as that between uh, the most overlapping neurodevelopmental disorders. So yeah. a big research gap, I think, uh, hopefully this will spark some new research. Thanks. Okay, Martijn Mater. Uh, thanks. It was really interesting. Um, in, in how, how I look at it, a diagnosis is not a phenotype, it's a label 
apply to phenotypes. And um, I'm, I'm not sure how that goes in most studies. Is, is the diagnosis, is that something that was already established in, in the people in the, uh, like in the, in the twins by, by uh, just uh, practice? Or is there usually a diagnostic procedure in the study? So, yeah, so the, the answer is yes, yes. So we, we looked at both measures of that actually form, formal diagnosis or clinical cutoffs and also continuous measures of aut autistic uh, traits or uh, ADHD traits. And we found that across both these types of measures, the uh, irritability estimates were high and genetic uh, associations were uh, high as well but when we did we did look separately not only actually between categorical and continuous but uh, also uh, we even looked at the role that the the different um, questionnaire that uh, different studies used for measuring these traits could have a role or the different reporters that reported on the, this questionnaire whether they had uh, they played a role on the, the difference in these estimates and we didn't find overall that that, um, uh, that uh, played a, a significant role in the general. Also, also not in the differences between countries, but I suppose there would be a correlation between between the kind of diagnosis and the and, and countries, right? Oh, oh, it could be, but uh, but I don't know, Aga, whether we actually analyzed uh, there, there is actually very country dependent because several countries, for example, Sweden, they used medical birth uh, registers. So these are kind of national uh, statistic registers where they hold the data like from birth from very early on. And then if they want to do longitudinal testing, if they do have that data, they can carry on or kind of probably the same individuals are also recruited into smaller data sets that does more detailed testing. Uh, but for these, like, these are mostly the versions of the DSM or the ICD that are used. Whereas, for example, for the UK, uh, there is no, like, a medical birth, birth register. There are only cohorts that are tested using questionnaires, but also clinical diagnosis. But these are normally, this normally yields a small sample because a lot of studies excludes individuals with, like, a formal severe diagnosis. Um, also due to difficulties with further testing. Um, so I think that I would say for um, like Sweden or Denmark, there are probably more uh, of these national instruments used like DSM and ICD. And then for, let's say the UK, the Netherlands, um, also um, like other Western, like the US, uh, more, more of the studies uses ex the actual questionnaires and which are also age dependent uh, rather than like just um, the clinical ones that are used for everyone. Thanks. Can I maybe have the honor of asking the last question? Uh, so thanks for his uh, beautiful piece of work and also chapeau to Aga. Um, it's very impressive. I had a question about uh, clinical implications. So one thing you mentioned about the, um, the correlation between the C components, the shared environment, is that it's, you noted that as a limitation that you couldn't really study that because so many studies report with that. But I think that's just a result in itself that often the best fitting model does not include um, NRC. Um, so what is in overall, what would you say, I don't know whether Aga or Margarita wants to answer, what would you say that the implications are of finding very little C and big A's and also to, substantial genetic relations? Do you want to take it, Aga? Um, yes, so um, based on our approach, we decided to um, just choose the best fitting model from each studies, even though several studies did report full model as well. However, then the C would be really small and not significant, so we just... I uh, use that rule of thumb to use the best fitting model. Um, and I think that's that's actually the case because when you take out C, then you know that variance will likely go into A. And we can see that for, I would say probably 70% of the studies that we identified, um, 
and also a lot a lot of studies um that i've seen um yeah quite a lot of them maybe like hundreds like a hundred would um, just report an a so for example if the study focus on the genetic correlation and the genetic influence they would just focus on a so they would sometimes not even report other components or variants and a lot of studies from i don't know the 90s um, they would use a DF extremes analysis that also mostly focus on A, and sometimes the rest of the residual they they report as E. So there is no C at all, and until and, the, like the you know some of the more uh, recent uh, DF extremes analysis when they actually report the C, the original ones just report the A, and everything that's not A it's E. Mm -hmm. uh, so and I can then following up on the on that strong RA. So for ADHD and um, developmental motor coordination disorder, you found an RA of 0.90. So it's basically the same genetic influence. So would you still would you still consider two separate disorders, or maybe not? Well, I should say that the standard error for that was very large. Though. Oh, okay. So, so this is not, I should not overinterpret this one. Very small. Was I think a standard error of point eight or something like that. so it was very large indicating that the the sample the, the the studies the two or three studies that we found were very small in sample so very underpowered um so again another major gap um in 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 the in the in the literature but but i think that the the reason why we say that we hope that this work uh, to the extent that is uh that is incomplete because of course the uh, uh the, the major the, the research gaps are major, but we hope that it will inform educational uh, and clinical practice to the extent that, um, for example, uh, based on this pattern of genetic and environmental over, uh, overlap, particularly genetic overlap, we could even think about expanding the screening for highly comorbid conditions when a child is diagnosed with one, for example, uh, ADHD and uh, motor disorder, potentially uh, leveraging the knowledge that we uh, that we collated in this piece of work to to inform educators and clinicians, uh, and potentially ex extend the diagnostic screenings across more than one condition, which at the moment is very rarely done. Mm -hmm. Okay, final final question for Eko de Geus. Yes, thank you. It's a bit related to the previous, uh, and I know I great. I'm greatly appreciative of the amount of work it already is to extract the statistics from all these papers. But did you also do a meta analysis on the MC and DC correlations, or the the DC slash sibling correlations? Because that could actually help you resolve whether there, whether there is C or non additivity across all studies jointly. Aga, you take this. No, we didn't do that. The only. Uh... The only uh, case in which we looked at the twin correlations was if the study did not actually report the model fitting statistics, then we would look at the twin correlations to determine the best fitting model and then calculate um, the statistics using the Falconer's formula. Uh, and we, we, I think we decided not to, not to do that because not to do a separate meta-analysis of just the twin correlations was um, because we had such a large heterogeneity in terms of the designs. So we had some studies did report twin correlations, some studies only reported the actual model fitting statistics that this would not, uh, this would not quite uh, fit with the whole picture. But if you look in the supplementary material, we have um, an analysis where we stratify by the model. So we provide separate um, estimates for the A only model, the AC model, the AE model, uh, from the ACE model, from the um, from the structural equation modeling approach, as well as the DF extremes approach, all the models reporting uh, whatever statistics, so A, AE, or AC, uh, as well as uh, we provide separate estimates for those studies for where we had to calculate it ourselves from the twin correlations. And these differences are not major, but uh, if you're interested, then uh, it's all in the supplementary material. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot for all your questions. Uh, it's already five past one, so I think we should go with.
you could not call it a day, but call it a seminar. <laughs> what, <laughs> what would the expression be? So thanks a lot for uh, coming along and especially thanks to Margarita and Aga for presenting uh, their amazing work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if you're interested, just check out our preprint and hopefully we'll see you in person very soon. <laughs> Bye. Have a lovely day. <laughs>